with us, we are inviting uh, Jerry Lanfear from Elixir to provide uh, the information about uh, this, um, this why well, going to use the word consortium, but probably is not the right one. Jerry will, will tell us what would be a right uh, word for this uh, community, product community collaboration uh, across different countries and, and different institutions. Uh, please remember that we will have a wrap up meeting on Saturday. Uh, so sorry about having this in the middle of the Easter holiday. Um, but yeah, well, that's the way that we plan it from the beginning and, and you knew the dates. Uh, so please keep working with the good work. And now let's going to have um, our webinar about Elixir. Keep hacking and thank you very much. Jerry, please. Okay, thanks, Leila. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Okay, so yeah, I'm Jerry Lowen here. I'm the Elixir CTO. I'm based uh, in the UK at the uh, Hinkston Cambridge site uh, near Cambridge. And my what I'm going to talk about today is just a general introduction to Elixir. So the first two thirds of the slides are really for people who haven't heard about Elixir in the past. And then the last third is, is really how Elixir is, is responding um, to uh, the current crisis that, that that we're facing, so which will be a very much work in progress. But I'll, I'll give you um, a, some guide guides to where you can you know, find the sorts of services and, and so on. Some of which we've heard about already in the in the previous session. Um, you can you can access. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So what's the idea of Elixir? So the idea of Elixir is that it it connects national bioinformatics centres. Uh, and institutes from uh, across multiple countries and the MBLEBI into a sustainable European infrastructure for biological research data um, with the idea that that, that, that data that's an underpins life science research across academia and industry. So it's not just about uh, human data, it's not just about sequence data, it's about all molecular data that we may be interested in for human agriculture, industry and, and increasingly uh, in environment, so we're increasingly considering uh, working on, on biodiversity and so on. So if we go to the next slide. So Elixir fits into a, a broader landscape of European infrastructures. So the figure on the left there uh, it illustrates how Elixir is positioned as a sort of foundational data infrastructure for the health and food domain. So all those other boxes you see are other research infrastructures within Europe. Um, that have various functions, so you know, bioimaging, biobanking, and clinical trials, and so on and so forth, uh, supporting you know, much of the work that's also going on around uh, COVID-19 research. And Elixir fits into that landscape as a sort of underpinning um, uh, infrastructure. And of course, we closely collaborate with those other research infrastructures, and I'll touch on that slightly later. Uh, next slide, please, Leila. Um, we are a member state organisation, so we currently have uh, 23 members. So uh, Cyprus there has joined recently as an observer and are on track to become a full member. We then have 22 full members, including the Ember EBI. And that little orange spot there is the location of the Elixir Hub, as I mentioned, where I'm based at the, uh, at the Cambridge site at Hingston, um, where there's a, we have about 25 staff at the Hub, and of course, we, we, we try to coordinate the activity across all of the member states. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, in this sort of presentation, I'm always asked about how is Elixir funded? And actually, Elixir is funded in a number of different ways. So if we start over on the right hand side, um, lower right hand side, we have the internal funding that the Elixir Hub receives. So that comes from the annual contribution by the member states. So every year, each of the members contributes a, uh, a certain amount based on their essentially based on their gross domestic product um, and that pays for the running of the secretariat and the technical operations at the Elixir hub but also actually in the most part pays for what we call commission services so that's uh, projects that are implemented within our nodes um, that to, to, to fulfill a particular task or need or bring nodes together to work together um, to fulfill a particular need. We also get funding from EU projects, increasingly so, and that's probably a, an increasing 
proportion of the funding that Elixir has. So Horizon 2020 grants um, and IMI grants. So we've, we've, we're now involved in probably about 10 different uh, European grants from the hub and also, of course, from our many more from the nodes. And then, then we have the node level funding. So that's the, the nodes, the funding that the nodes receive from their member states that they reside in. Um, so that could be national roadmap funding and also, of course, competitive research grants that are obtained within within their countries. And, and that's actually by far and away the largest component of the, of the funding of Elixir. So Elixir really has funding from multiple different sources in order to um, try and coordinate all of this activity to reduce duplication and increase uh, coordination across the different member states. Uh, next slide, please. And, and that, that ties into our strategy, really, which is about connecting national and international services into a European-wide federation. And I've highlighted there on the left-hand side our, our, uh, our platforms, and I'll come back to that in a second because they're critical to the way that we operate. And really, it's about using those services and platforms to connect across the nodes to present a single federated um, service to the, to, to the wider scientific community. Next slide. So just a few slide or two on uh, how we're organized, because I think that's really important to understand how we work. Uh, so I've mentioned our nodes, and I'll, I'll just cite one example in a second about how the nodes are structured. Um, I've also mentioned our platforms, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about our platforms, but we also have communities, which are groups of scientific experts from a particular discipline drawn you know, from across a scientific domain, from across our nodes that work together and it's the communities that really provide the glue between the wider scientific activity across Europe and our services. Uh, next slide, please. So if we have a look first at the node, it's our nodes. So um, uh, Elixir nodes are funded nationally, obviously. Um, they build, typically they build on national strength. So different Elixir nodes tend to focus in different areas, whether it's on human data, or, or, or compute or, or whatever it might be there, there tends to be a, a, a focus which is probably increasing over time uh, that degree of focus um, and, and the nodes provide a national framework for how that long-term resource management can occur so here's an example just one example is the German node which is organized into something called DEMBI uh, they have uh, 39 project partners within the country 30 institutions eight service centers all part of um, the German node in Elixir. If we go to the next slide, just a little bit more detail. And within the German node, uh, you have you know named individuals that are aligned with Elixir, whether it's with the Elixir board um, or as the head of node, the, uh, leading the node within the country, technical coordinators, training coordinators. And we can have, in some nodes, we have named individuals that are aligned with individual platforms and communities. So very much you have a hub and spoke model for with which are the member states and then within each member state you have a uh, further hub and spoke model um, and, we, and, and that's that's how we end up with about 220 institutes within elixir can i just confirm that you can still hear me because i just had a, a flag that my internet was dropping Yes, we have missed uh, like a couple of syllables, I would say, but um, we are hearing you. Yes. Okay, very good. I'll, I'll carry on. Then I was slightly concerned I was speak, not speaking to anybody. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next slide. Um, it, we're moving fairly quickly here. Next, okay, yeah. Next slide. So um, now we move on to the platforms. So these these are the organisationally the owners of our or coordinators of our services. So we have five platforms: the tools, data, compute, interoperability, and training. And then for each each platform, we have uh, uh, what we call an exco. Uh, so that's a senior bioinformatician from 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 one of our nodes um, that volunteers their time to lead the platform. So for instance, within the tools platform, we have Sava from Elixir Spain, Hervé. Uh, from Elixir France and Bjorn from, from Elixir Germany. They work together to set the strategy for the tools platform. They typically sit in that role for four to six years with us. Uh, so it's a significant investment of time. We have that across all the platforms, three uh, Xcos per platform. And, and the reason why training is only two currently is uh, Gabri, who is our 
our, our exco up until very recently has just left so we're in the process of uh, recruiting a uh, or appointing a, a new training platform expo and then uh, importantly as well as me at the hub um, we have uh, a platform coordinator for each of the platforms so Jen's been Jen Harrow there for the tools platform and closely involved in uh, the uh, the bio hackathon this week um, I'm actually the interim data platform coordinator whilst we we're also recruiting into that position uh, Jonathan Teds uh, leads the coordinates the compute platform uh, Sarah uh, coordinates interoperability and then Pascal who's an external contractor um, uh, coordinates our training platform so if we go to the next slide uh, so then the final sort of organizational slides are our communities and as I mentioned before the idea is that they connect our infrastructure with the life science research experts so uh, we currently have 11 established communities um, three around human data and then a, a range of other technical and scientific uh, 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 communities. Um, you, you may well ask, how did these arise? And with the exception of, of human data, most of these arrived, ar ar arose uh, bottom up. So this has been an organic kind of movement within Elixir to establish the areas that, that were perceived as being important to the, to the Elixir uh, members. Um, and some of these communities have been around, around for a while. Uh, for four, five, six years, so they're quite well established, and, and others are, are, are relatively new. The key thing is that they provide this link between our kind of service infrastructure and the wide, wider scientific uh, uh, communities. Um, the idea is also that they drive service developments in the Elixir platform, so there's a close, we try to ensure close alignment between what the communities want, what the services, what the platforms can deliver. Um, and typically they're building and developing community standards. And we've seen that in multiple cases across different communities. So if you go on to the next slide, Leila. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the services. So we see how we've, we're organized. Um, and uh, a key thing that underpins that organization is how we present our services, which are wide and, and numerous. So it can be around data deposition, data management, um, at, adding value to data, so that would be knowledge bases like Uniprot and Ensemble and Orphanet, ensuring that data is in, interoperable. In fact, we've got uh, Carol, from, in, who's one of our uh, interoperability ex-co's on, on, the, on the call here today, um, or at least she was. Um, we've got compute services, bioinformatics tools to analyse data. Uh, we've got uh, services that link academia into industry. And of course, last but not least, we've got services that center on training, um, either provision of training itself or, or things like train the trainer and so on. Uh, so wide and various. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, and and we, we, we start to organize those services. So to give you some idea, our node services run into the hundreds. So these are selected and uh, reviewed at the node level. Um, and they run into several hundred services now. Some of those uh, services uh, form part of our key service collections. So that's our core data resources, our deposition databases, and our uh, recommended interoperability resources. And, and a few um, services will form what we refer to as an Elixir infrastructure service. So this will be operated by the hub and regarded as fundamental for many communities and nodes, of which currently there's only one of those, but we see, we see more in the future. Um, but that's our kind of conceptual way that we see our services fitting together. So if we go to the uh, next slide. These services can be accessed from our website, so you can search by node or by scientific name, d domain, type of service, which kind of maps onto our platforms, and of course our key service collections, um, such as the core data resources. Um, and I I think I had a slide around the core data resources just to touch on that, the key service collections. Next slide. Um, yeah, so, so we, we, we work quite hard to, particularly around our key service collections, to have a centralised uh, way of selecting and identifying the resources that we regard as, as most critical. So I'll just highlight one of those key service collections, which is the core data resources, which is the most mature. These are data resources of fundamental importance for the research community, uh, often at a global level, 
and for the long-term preservation of, of life science data. So we go through a quite uh, rigorous uh, nomination and selection review process to identify these. There are currently 19 of them. Um, and uh, th th these have been a, a significant output of the uh, Elixir infrastructure that we've that over the past few years. And I can you know, highlight that these now move forward to something called the Global Biodata Coalition, which you may not have heard of, which is a global effort across uh, all geographies to start to um, provide sustainable funding for these critical core data resources, not, not just from Europe, but also from uh, the, UE, the, the US uh, and Asia um, to collectively support those da data financially in the long term so that they're sustained on behalf of the global community. Um, I mean, there's a full talk in these, so I, I won't go into any more detail. But okay, so that's the that's a sort of um, quick tour of Elixir, what we do and how we how we restructure and what we offer. So what about specifically to do with COVID-19? Next slide. Um, so, um, and these are, I would, say, I would say these slides put together over the last day or two and uh, are subject to change would be the, you know, the, the best way to look at this. So all nodes, as far as we know, are involved in coordinating research or data responses within their countries to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, we probably, at the hub, we don't know everything that's going on currently. We are starting, and I'll come back to this in a second, starting to sort of catalogue capture all of the work that's ongoing. Um, so that across across Elixir, what the hub is trying to do is coordinate. So both the, the response where it's needed from across the nodes, including cataloging activities, but essentially trying to have Elixir speaking with one voice on behalf of the nodes when required. And of course, that's typically at a European level rather than within node. Um, but also, I talked about the, the S3, the research infrastructures early in the talk, um, also coordinating response across the other research infrastructures, so building on our EOS Life project, um, but also building on our, our established collaborations with those other SFREs, so that as, as the requirements for you know, cross-discipline uh, needs emerge around COVID-19, um, all those infrastructures um, are, are be able to respond adequately. And then uh, finally uh, is collating COVID-19 relevant surface services. Uh, so that's sort of pulling those services out of that 400 that we have arising from our nodes or hundreds that we have arising from our nodes, surfacing them via the Elixir webpage so that there's a sort of one-stop shop for Elixir services relevant to COVID-19. Um, and I'll, I'll point to the webpage there. Um, I, this obviously is rapidly evolving and currently has significant weekly updates and additions. So we, usually it's on a, on a Monday that we update the website currently. And I'll just, the next few slides are just taken directly from the website just to highlight uh, the various uh, things that are happening. So if we go to the next slide. So this was, I pulled this from the website this morning just after the, uh, the update yesterday. So if you want to find a database to store your data, then we encourage researchers to deposit their data in the deposition databases. And we heard a bit about that uh, from one of the projects, I think, earlier. Yeah, we encourage that all raw and consensus viral sequence data should be deposited uh, within the European Nucleotide Archive. And Emberly BI is a dedicated page to assist in deposition sharing of um, the SARS uh, CoV 2 uh, data into ENA or other molecular databases. databases. So if it's uh, you know, transcriptomics data, et cetera, there's the, the relevant repository there. Um, and you can get support, uh, like help desk essentially, by emailing that uh, virus.dataflow at EBI uh, before submission. So there's, there is uh, on hand help. Um, I, I should say that all of these slides, the links are live here. So, so feel free to go into the slides and uh, follow the links and, and, and find out more. If you already up your know, consensus sequence data to GISAID, um, then uh, we encourage you to also upload your data to ENA so that it's, it's, it's there for the wide community to use. So if you want to access data relevant to COVID-19, I'd highlight the BridgeDB data set, uh, includes human and heart, SARS-related coronavirus gene and protein mapping, um, I, won't, I won't go through every single one of these. The so Cellosaurus uh, is, has frequently updated information on the cell lines useful for the study of SARS of, of, of COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Uniprot and Swissprot are 
uh, going to have a special early release with annotated information, curated information around the protein sequences of the virus. And the uh, Guide to Pharmacology is actively uh, curating uh, compounds and inhibitors useful for SARS-CoV-2 proteins um, and starting to capture some of the pharmaco pharmacological strategies that are being undertaken. So if you go to the next uh, slide... Um, so, for instance, to make your data easier to find and share, there's the, the recommended interoperability resources. So the RIRs are the kind of interoperability equivalent of the CDRs that I talked about just now. Um, the idea is they, they make data findable, they make data, data fair, essentially. So 3D BioNotes annotates biochemical and biomedical information onto structural models, etc. I talked about uh, uh, BridgeDB. Also highlight the fair sharing database, which is starting to curate a COVID-19 collection of standards and databases relevant to COVID-19. Um, you probably all heard of the uh, bio.tools, so the Elixir Tools Registry. So this is all about curating and flagging software around COVID-19. And of course, the uh, Galaxy workflows for analysis of genomics and chemical data uh, is, is also quite well known we highlight there. So if you go to the next slide, I don't really know how I'm doing for time, Leila. Um, compute We're resources. Fine. Okay, so compute resources, obviously always relevant. So a number of different nodes have, 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 have compute resources available that can be used for COVID-19 research. Um, so the, I talked about Elixir Germany and the, and the DEMBI organization. So they have something called the DEMBI Cloud, uh, CSC in Elixir Finland. Um, has prioritised access for its cloud services for COVID-19 and so on and so forth. So there's, there's plenty to look at here around access to um, uh, compute services. So for Galaxy, there's a, a genomic analysis available through the Lanikia Elixir. It is, it is its on-demand platform. Plenty of opportunity to contribute to Elixir's work on COVID-19. Of course, we're, we're here at the uh, Biohackathon, the COVID-19 Biohackathon. Um, there's a COVID-19 disease map is being generated. Certainly there's help required around curating biotools and also the fair sharing COVID-19 collection that I talked about above. Um, next slide. Um, just to highlight, we do capture here some emerging COVID-19 publications. I'm sure this won't be complete uh, given uh, time, but it'll, it's a useful you know, starting point to find uh, rapidly emerging publications. Um, we also provide a link to the other research, the other European research infrastructures, so biobanking, whatever it may be. <coughs> There's a link there. Uh, if you want to find out more, then please contact uh, Cathy Lauer, who's our uh, temporary uh, coordinator for all our activity related to COVID, uh, or we indeed visit the Elixir Services page. Um, so that that uh, final final piece on this is just a slide that I got from Jonathan Tetz, who's our uh, compute platform coordinator, specifically the work that I, I think has been done provisioning virtual mach machines for the various projects or some of the projects that have been ongoing this week. Um, so these were virtual machines that were provisioned, I believe, to quickly give people access to compute facilities um, in order to do some of the work. And that's that's hopefully the sort of thing that, that Elixir can do, you know, can qu quickly coordinate this type of activity um, to provide what we hope is going to agile support for um, important events. So I'm, I'm more or less done there. Hopefully I've given you a flavour. If you go to the next slide. Um, but I've got so I guess, a few final remarks. So this is definitely a snapshot, particularly obviously the COVID-related um, material. This is a snapshot, it's rapidly evolving, and the COVID slides herein, so the last few slides that I've been talking to, they'll be out of date probably by next Monday because we will have updated the, the service offerings that Elixir can make. Obviously, we welcome input and, 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 and suggestions from, from this community and all more widely. And uh, to do that, as I said, the first point of contact is Cathy Lauer, who's based at the Hub, who's coordinating all of this uh, activity. I think I've got one last slide. So lots of uh, social media channels to keep in contact. So I won't go through all of these, but Twitter and LinkedIn and so on. So feel free to take these links and, and sign up uh, if you wish. And, and I'll stop there.
uh, hopefully that was useful. Um, I know there's some people that have heard all this already, but hopefully it was useful for people that are new to Elixir. Thank you very much, Terry. We are going to unmute everybody in case um, people want to ask questions. So I'm unmuting. Oh, I'm trying at least. It should have worked, but it's it's asking each person to unmute. They have the choice. Oh, okay, okay. So now they can uh, unmute themselves. Um, everybody, hopefully, if not, just raise your hand. So if uh, anyone has any question for Jerry, please go ahead. Can I ask a question? Of course, please, Pietro, go ahead. So Jerry. Um... You know, it's, it is truly amazing what Elixir is doing, and it's also truly, truly amazing what the free software community is doing. But I find in general the two, um, you know, groups do not really interoperate that well. Do you have any suggestions how we can improve things? Um, so actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that to Jen because that's that's an area that you've been looking at, Jen. Um. I, w I would say the biohackathons actually help improve things because there's a lot of exchange there. I, I mean, Elixir started holding a large biohackathon. We're on our third one organized this year. And, you know, even non-Elixir communities can join. They get funded for that. And I think that's encouraging the exchange as well as the best practices community. The tools platform in general tries to I would say engage with the open science communities as much as they can. Um, I don't know. Was there anything particular, Piotr, that you, you thought we were lacking or that was missing? No, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to think along, you know. So, um, I mean, from, from the free software community, we know that um, there's always a, uh, a lack of resources, right, when it comes to running pipelines, storing data um, in, you know, the different, running a, you know, a Sparkle uh, service. Um, you know, how, how do we lower the barrier to entry and how can we make sure that these, you know, projects, once they're running, that they are sustainable? Um, I, don't, I don't particularly, you know, want to encourage the model where EBI comes up with a service um, or anyone else, you know, in, in, inside the consortium and that people are just asked to deliver data and, 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 and wait for results, right? <clears throat> I mean, you would like, you'd like to have something more flexible. Uh, yes, I mean, I know for the tools platform in general, they're, they're moving everything, all the tools like Open eBench out to GitHub and you know everybody can contribute to that. So, I mean, there are some resources, especially the EBI where they, they have, you know, so many dependent people on their resources, they have a different idea of how, how to keep their pipelines going. But I think in general, we, we are as open as we can. But, you know, please send us feedback, either via the tools platform or, or your, you know, any Elixir contacts you have to for improvement. If I may That's, say something. Yeah, of course, again. Leila. Yep, of so what I have seen as well is that Elixir communities particularly, mm -hmm. um, they are not based on just one country. For a community to emerge in Elixir, what I have seen is that you need at least two nodes working together. So it also facilitates collaborations across different countries, and it also facilitates that both countries, or more than two actually, uh, will provide resources that will make the whole thing more sustainable uh, at the end because it's not just one institution saying like, oh, we will host this, but uh, multiple institutions across multiple countries collaborating together. So I would say that also helps a little bit to make the whole thing sustainable because mm -hmm. you have multiple partners. Right. Maybe I can ask a question to the participants and panel members. You know, <laughs> whether, whether anyone here, <laughs> you know, anyone here has is using uh, Elixir resources for their um, uh, free software. No one stepping up. <laughs> so, so all I'd say is that, um, so, so I think that all of the services that are offered through Elixir, with the exception of the compute, for which that the, the, there is frequently may require to be a charge because of the 
the hardware and, and our overheads and so on associated with that. But the vast majority of the services that we we uh, list are free and open to use by anybody. Um, Certainly, well, I, mean, I think that's. I don't think there are any services apart from compute that where we would charge for access. So, so the, these are uh, uh, most most of those services are funded via the nodes themselves. So, so the sort of in-country funding mechanisms. Um, maybe that's not answering your question, Piot. Yeah, maybe mm. something that I could say about what Piotr is saying is that um, Elixir is very, very well known in Europe, uh, but sometimes it doesn't reach other parts um, of the globe. So I don't know, Piotr, if uh, your question goes a bit on, on that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, 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 it's a really broad question in a way, right? I mean, how do how do communities interact? Um, I just want to mention one thing, which may be something you could think about. There's a, there's a fan fantastically successful um, uh, grant scheme from the EU 2020 at the moment, where they, where they essentially um, um, give a grant to an organization, for example, um, an LNET in the Netherlands. And this organization can, can, can write uh, small subgrants, you know, or, or allow people to put in small applications for developing free software. Um, and these applications tend to, you know, be in order of 50,000 uh, euros um, or dollars. Um, and it's amazing how, how much impact uh, uh, these projects have. You know, I don't know, you know, whether it would fit a lecture in some way, but I think, um, you know, it, it, is, it is one way to think about how you interact with, with the free software community, where people are writing software in their free time, essentially. Yeah, so I mean, so I think, I think, the answer to this, I think, is that the, we what, what Elixir couldn't do, I think, basically because we, we only have limited funding ourselves, you know, that's funneled through the hub. We couldn't uh, fund the the, the uh, development in the way you just described uh, of those um, uh, software products. What we could consider, and I think the Bio Hackathon is kind of you know part of that, is is how can we facilitate that happening. So this, how could you, how could you incorporate that into a future, some future um, grant submission proposal, um, or or how can we uh, have events like I'd say the Bio Hackathon that that encourages uh, that type of activity to to take place. The one thing we can't do, unfortunately, is kind of fund that activity because we we're not funded at that level. Is that's the honest answer. Yeah, but you, you can you could apply to the same scheme that uh, you know Horizon Twenty Twenty offers and see if you yeah. can get you know a similar similar type of project going. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, maybe any other question? question? Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, please, Taswo, go ahead. Um, so I I don't I don't know if this question is suitable to ask here but the so elixir has already uh, worked very uh, much about the COVID-19 but uh, here in this virtual by hackathon we had a problem of the data sharing from the GISA ID right so uh, so do does elixir have a plan to say something to GISA ID if like some um, to open their data or something like that because of the you know what Erixir is doing is really nice because of the data is data and the software all uh, open on the internet that everyone can access and then every everything should be fair which is okay but uh, in this situation so so we have a problem because the the data is outside of the the repository uh, of Elixir or the ISDC or something like that so um. I think we, I mean, Elixir and also the Japanese community, Japanese database center, uh, need to appeal that uh, the data should be open, even if it's the the virus sequence or something like that. So, is there any possibility that the Elixir will act something for that? So I think I, I'm not going to specifically comment on on GISAID and their policies. So that's that's the first mm -hmm. thing. The second is, as I think uh, I mentioned in one of the slides above, 
Um, the you know our, our message is that to make sure that the, the, this DNA sequence data is is open and available for everyone is to load raw and consensus data into um, ENA European Nucleotide Archive, Archive or of course the the other repositories in in, in other parts of the world um, that all link together. Um, now. Um, the, the five and, and the, the, there's no reason why you can't also load your consensus data into GISAID at the same time. Um, now, what I, the final piece of, of that is that we do know that Emily and I are talking to GISAID about um, you know what uh, is there any way that the current situation could be changed or updated, and I, I'm, I'm not involved in those discussions. So, but I do know that they are talking to one another. Okay, thanks. Do we have any other question? Okay, so I think we can close uh, now this webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry, for your presentation. And thank you to all the attendees to this uh, webinar about Elixir. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we can just close here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, go Thank back you, to hacking Elena. now. Thank you, Tasbro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.